Praise the Lord. Readings taken from 1 Chronicles, chapter 2, uh, 29. I've got verses 1 to 9. Right. It's the gifts for building of the temple. Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because of this palatial structure. It's not for man, but for the Lord our God. With all my resources I provided for the temple of my God, gold for the gold work, silver for the silver work, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colours, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all of these in large quantities. Besides in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and above everything I provided for this holy temple. 3,000 talents of gold, gold of offer, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls and the buildings, for the gold work and the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? Then the leaders of families, the office of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave towards the work on the temple of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze and 100,000 talents of iron. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in the custody of Jehol the Gershonite. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. David's Prayer David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers Abraham, Isaac and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes and decrees and to do everything to build this palatial structure for which I have provided. Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the King. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Peter and Janet, for uh, reading the scriptures this morning. You did a, a much better job than what I could ever do. So thank you very much for that. I'll cut to the chase and, and get into what I want to talk about th th this morning. 
uh, I want to talk about building up the temple, building up the temple. And what I really want to emphasize really is the temple is built up through the generosity of God's people. Now, uh, hopefully we've got a, a slide to show you here of uh, two main structures that we read about in the, in the Old Testament. There was the, the temple of uh, Solomon, which is on the left there, and then there was the tabernacle of, of, of Moses. And, and we read about those two structures, and really what they were, they were the dwelling place of God. God dwelt in the tabernacle of Moses, and God dwelt in the uh, building of, of, of Solomon. And really, it was, it was pointing to the day when we would become God's temple. In other words, God's visible presence upon the earth, because these places were the dwelling place of God. He, he dwelt first in the tabernacle, and then he dwelt in the uh, building of, of Solomon. And now today, we are, we are the temple of God. Did you realize that? Paul, he was writing to the, uh, a church at Corinth in chapter 6, and he says, Don't you know that you are the temple and that God lives within you? And then he says, Therefore, honor God in your body. So we are the temple of God, the dwelling place of God as individuals, but corporately we are the temple of God. Did you realize that? God dwells within his church. Now, the interesting thing about the, the temple and the tabernacle was that these buildings were brought together as a result of the generosity of God's people. And really, that's what I, I really want to speak about this morning, the generosity of God's people, which enabled this temple to be built. Now, there, there's an interesting story in relation to the tabernacle of Moses. Incidentally, it was more of a tent than a, a building, and it was a temporary one as, a, as opposed to the, ta, uh, the building of Solomon, which was more of a, a, a permanent one. But there's a, a couple of verses of scripture I want to put on the screen. Uh, thank you to my assistant, Ali, for helping me here. And here's what we read about how they got the, uh, the, the resources in to build the, 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 the tabernacle of Moses. And it got to a stage where Moses said, So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing, and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they had already had was more than enough to do all the work. Now that's quite something, isn't it, really? Uh, Rich, could you just take a stand, please? This is the man who deals with our money. Give him a clap, will you? <laughs> and I want to say publicly, Rich, you do sterling work. You really do. Sterling work, all right? And I I'd like to see a, a, a time in this church where Rich will get before this church and he'll say, No more! We have got we have got more money than what we need. Uh, cancel your standing orders. We're going to take the offering box away because you know you blessed us so much uh, that we don't know need any more. Well, <laughs> I don't think we're at that place yet where we'll do that. But we do depend on the generosity of God's people. Now I want to talk about the building of the. Uh, sanctuary that was made by, by, by Solomon. And there's just a few things, and once again, thank you Peter and Janet for reading the scriptures uh, to us. Um, I, want to all, I want to look first of all at, at the challenge, the challenge that, that David, the king, gave to the people. It says all the assembly was there, the leaders, just the ordinary folks, probably the, the children were there as, 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 as well. And here we read that, that David uh, challenges the people. He says, who then is willing to consecrate himself to the Lord uh, this day? Now, David invested in something that he would never see. He would never see the 
building that was going to be built by his son. But what he could do was that he could, he could take steps to make certain that all the material that they needed was there so that they could build something for the glory of God. God's permanent sanctuary. And so after he gave, and boy, the king gave a lot out of his own personal possessions. But after setting the example, he says, now, who's willing to consecrate himself to the Lord this day? And that's the challenge that I would like us all to, to leave today with. Who then is willing to consecrate himself to the Lord? Now, he did not say, I want your money. Have you noticed that? But he said, who's willing to consecrate himself to the Lord? I, I don't want your stuff. I don't want your material possessions. I want God to have you. Have you got it? I want God to have you. Now, there's a verse of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. And uh, if you want chapters from the Bible that talk about uh, giving, you, you probably will find no greater chapters than 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, chapter 9. And I was thinking about doing something from that, but honestly, uh, you could preach six months from, that, from those two chapters when it talks about generosity. But I, I like this, what, what Paul says about a certain group of churches. He's right into this church at Corinth, and he's talking about their generosity. It just, it just blew his mind how certain churches in Macedonia were so generous in, in terms of this offering that they were taking for the needy saints in Jerusalem. And notice what it says there. And it says this, And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So before they gave their money... They gave themselves to God. First, they gave themselves to the Lord. And you know what? When God has your heart, the money follows. Is everybody excited about this sermon this morning? You don't look too excited as yet. All right, we'll get there. When God has your heart, he has your money. It's as simple as that. I've got a... I was quoting John Stott the, the other week. I've, um, I've got a quote from a fellow called John Blanchard here. Oh, I have to put it this distance here because of my eyesight, all right? This Gideon Old is not agreeing with me, by the way. John Blanchard says this, A friend of mine who has been in Christian service for many years once said, Unconsecrated Christian giving is the greatest hindrance in Christian progress, and I am inclined to agree with him. It hinders progress in the spiritual life of the Christian concern because God has promised blessing to the giver. And it hinders progress in Christian work, which so often has to limp along because of lack of funds. Where do you stand in this whole area? Are you part of the problem or part of the answer? For me, I want to be part of the answer. I, I, want, I want God to bless RK. Let, let, me, let me give you a little personal testimony. I, I've, been a, I've been a part of the church here now. It must be getting near seven years now. And uh, one of the things that attracted me to the church and, and drew me to the church was that uh, there, there was no 10, 15-minute appeal before the offering. And I remember I, I spoke to the existing leaders at that time. I said, no, I, I, I appreciate that. But at the same time, people, Christian, God's people, need to, be, to know about their responsibility in terms of giving. They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also 
to us. If you're new to the church this morning, this is an unusual sermon to preach on. Uh, because I think almost in the six years I've been there, I don't think I've ever heard a, a message preached on giving. But hey, did you realize that about 50% of the parables that Jesus told were on the subject of money? Did you realize that? If you didn't, you know now, don't you? <laughs> 50%. The challenge. Where your heart is, your money will follow it. Do we believe in the local church? Do we, leave, do we believe in the ministries of the local church? Then we, we give ourselves to the Lord, and then we, out of that, our, our money follows. And so that was, that was the, the challenge. Secondly, that David gave to the people. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day? First, give yourself to the Lord, and then from that flows the generosity of your heart. The second thing I want us to look at is the response of the people. Well, it was fantastic. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm going to have a similar response this morning or not. Uh, sometimes I think, I, I, I wonder, do these messages kind of work against us sometimes? The people hold on to the money even more so because they don't like what they hear. Well, if this is treading on your corns this morning, well, I, I hope it hurts because, you know, we, we need to hear things like this as well. God's house, the work of God, depends upon the generosity of God's people. Now, I want you to notice something about this story. And I believe this is true. God is more concerned about the motive and the attitude of our hearts than what he is about the amount. God is more concerned about the, the willingness that we have as opposed to how much we can give or not give. And what you see in this story is a, a group of people who were willing, who were cheerful, and who were generous. Now, I've got a, a verse of scripture. I'm trying not to rush ahead of myself. But in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 7, which I said is the, the classic passage on the subject of Christian giving, uh, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he says, But since you excel in everything... And they were a very uh, talented church and a very gifted church. He says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have uh, kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. So God wants us to excel in the grace of giving. And everybody said, oh, man, Jen, I'm with you. Yeah, well, not too many. <laughs> I want you to excel in the grace of giving. I can understand why some preachers hate talking about money, because you never know what kind of response you're going to get. Excel in the grace of giving. Could we put that little um, thing on the, on the screen? Um, there's a, there's a caption that goes with that. Let me just read it to you. You can see, obviously, that's the hand of God up there. And um, I've got a book at home, and it's called um, Laughing in the Isles. And it's about different and amusing stories that go on in, in, in the church. And there's some really am, am, amusing ones which I've used. Uh, for instance... Uh, what, what lesson do we learn from, about David and Goliath? You know the lesson that we learn there? It's a very simple one, duck. <laughs> it's the way I tell them, I know, yeah. But there's, the caption with this, it, it, it tickled me anyways. Um, if it doesn't tickle you and the person next to you is not laughing, well, well then tickle them, all right? And here's the caption. Uh, a vicar was trying to persuade a millionaire to support the church steeple fund. He took him inside the tower and pointed to the cracks in the walls. Just then, a piece of masonry dislodged itself and struck the man uh, a glancing blow. So you can see that there, can't you? Good grief, he said, rubbing his head. I see what you mean. 
here's a check for 100 pounds. And then the vicar said, go on, Lord, shouted the vicar. Hit him again. <laughs> and, and again. <laughs> and again. And again. Wow. The response. What? It says that these people, they gave willingly. They weren't coerced into giving. There wasn't so many Oh, I, uh, I won't embarrass anybody. Getting there and shoving their arm up behind the back. You need to, to give. No, the people. And this is once again taught in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. They just gave willingly. Oh. Didn't send them on a guilt trip. And, and, and I've seen people do that at times, you know, when it comes to the offering. And we don't, we don't take up uh, an offering as such. I know there's a lot of churches don't do that now, but there is an offering box at the back, and there's standing orders, and once again, Rich is the man to see. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't do that because we depend upon the generosity of God's people. They gave willingly. No guilt trips, not coerced. Going back to 2 Corinthians 8 and, and, and 9, that principle is brought out there. Incidentally, you might say, Jim, you can't preach on offering from this passage of Scripture, but the principles that we have in this story are principles that we see scattered throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that is the principle of generosity and, and, and willingness. Incidentally, going back to 2 Corinthians 8, uh, the Apostle Paul says that God loves a cheerful giver. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't love you if you don't give cheerfully. But what it does mean is that God smiles when you give your money to God with a, with a, with a cheerful heart. Incidentally, that literal translation there is God loves a hilarious giver. In other words, you want to do cartwheels when you give to God. Should I do one? Would you just... I've done part of one, okay? Part of a cartwheel. Have you ever noticed when those goal, uh, uh, footballers, they score a goal, they, oh, well, they're kissing everybody and, and they're hugging everybody and they're dancing. Wow, we know that's the attitude we should have. Wow, an opportunity to give. Wow, hilarious. That's give. Cheerfully. And in this chapter in First Chronicle, you can just feel the joy that the people were expressing as they gave. Cheerful givers. Generously, that's brought out in this chapter as well. David in his prayer said, Lord, who are we that we should give so generously? I suppose in the, in, uh, the account of money today, we're talking about uh, millions and millions and millions of pounds. David said, who are we, God, that we should give so, so generously? I do believe that, that in the body of Christ that God does give maybe certain people an ability to make a lot of money to bless. I think that's scriptural as well, to bless the body of Christ. If you're one of them, could you see me after the service, please? <laughs> I have mentioned to Richard about a, a world cruise sometimes, but he hasn't, he hasn't responded to that at all for some reason. Um, but God calls us all to be generous. Whether you've, got, whether you've got a lot of dosh or you haven't got much dosh, God challenges us all to be generous. Paul writing about that church, the churches of Macedonia, it says that they gave generously out of their poverty. In actual fact, they came to me and they begged me for the opportunity to give. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic that after the service is over that, that people should come up the rich and you beg for the opportunity to set up a standing order or whatever, you know, but that's what happened back in the New Testament. They, they beg for the opportunity to give. Now, I have met many Christians like that who beg for the opportunity to give. So whether you have an abundance or whether you have 
whether you're as poor as a church mouse. The principle of generosity is something that we should all endeavor to excel in. Bible talks about giving proportionately, etc. Give what you give what you can. I like the story about two Cockney boys. Should I put on a Cockney accent? <laughs> We're not very good at them, are we? Yeah. Ali's Northern Ireland accent was wasn't very good. <laughs> apparently, apparently my Brahmi one the other week wasn't very good either. You know. Uh, but these two little Cockney boys, and they were talking about their devotion to one another. And one says, uh, Bobby, if you had a million pounds, you'd give me half, wouldn't you? Of course I would. How's that? How am I doing? Of course I would. And then he said, and if you had, if you had a thousand pounds, you'd give me half, wouldn't you? Of course I would. I'd do just the same. And then he said, and if you, had a, if you had a thousand marbles, you'd give me half, wouldn't you? Of course I would. You're my mate. And then he said, and if you had two marbles, you'd give me half, wouldn't you? And then there was a pause. And he says, that's not fair. You know I've got two marbles. <laughs> and look... It doesn't matter if you've got a thousand marbles in your bank account or just two. God calls us to be generous. Generous. God knows I don't want anybody to think of Jim that he's tight fisted. Oh. Um, and there's so many ways that that as a church we can be generous. And um, Chris is casting a, uh, a great vision for, for, the, for the church, but it needs, it needs money. So we've got the, the challenge, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day? And then we've got the response. It was a, it was a willing response. It was a generous response it was, a, it was a joyful response. It started with the leaders, and then the people followed in kind. And the last thing I want us to look at is, is the prayer. And there's a, a one part of the prayer that I want to, I want to read out to you, uh, and it'll be on the screen there. Um, and it, here's, here's an event that's taking place 1,000 years before, before the coming of Christ, 1,000 years B.C., David was um, going to provide the materials for his son Solomon to, to build the uh, house of God. He wasn't going to be there himself. And, and then he gathers the whole congregation together. And then he has this prayer. What a fantastic prayer it is. And, and this is what he, he prays. In the context of that, he prays this. And he, he sees the generosity and the willingness of the people. And then he says, but who am I and, and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We're not giving back to you, God, what is yours already anyway. Did you realize that the, that the house you live in, it's not yours, it's God's? Did you realize the, the car you drive, it's not yours, it's God's? Did you realize that the money that is in your bank account, is, it's, it's not yours, it's God's? And when we give, we're only giving back to God what is his. So it's not really so much how much of my money should I give to God. It's how much of God's money do I need to keep for myself. And I'm not talking about anything stupid or silly here. Uh, but I do believe this, that if you give, God blesses you. I do believe that. 
I've, I've seen that in my own life time and time again. I don't believe in this prosperity nonsense that, no, if you give your money, God is going to make you a millionaire. I remember I sat in one old lady's house and she kept getting these letters from a certain evangelist. He says, oh, and she was getting terribly upset about it. And I showed her that letter. I said, the next time you get a letter from this person, this is what you need to do. And I picked it up and I ripped it in her presence. And it was all this saying, if you give, God will bless you, etc. And you know what? That's true. God does bless us as, as we are never in debt because we give generously to God. But what we give to God is only what is his already anyways. That's in the prayer. Everything comes from your hand. Stewardship recognizes that everything comes from God. The story of the steward, the the, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, uh, the, the owner gives to... The servants, a certain amount, five talents. I personally think he's referring to money there uh, because he recognizes and he says, what did you do with the money? What have we we done? I think it was John Wesley who said that he didn't want to have a big bank balance when Jesus returned. And you know what? He was true to his word because when John Wesley passed away, his will was written out, He virtually left nothing behind in a material sense. He gave it all to God. How am I doing for time? Uh, Almost gone. Almost finished. You're enduring this ever so well. (laughs) All right. Two things in conclusion. Very, very, very quickly. First of all, the people gave... The people gave generously because they believed in the project. They believed in the temple. They believed in what it was going to accomplish. Now, and they were excited about giving to it. And it's okay. It's okay to give money to other things that are dear to you. I know for many years I gave to Teen Challenge on... Uh, a regular basis, because I believed in it. I saw how people's lives were changed. But I, I say this, and you might say, well, you would say this anyways, Jim, but I, 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 I'll say it anyways. I believe in the local church. I believe in the mission of the local church. I believe in the ministries of the local church. I believe in the vision of the local church. In fact, I can't see anything else except the local church in the, in the New Testament. And so therefore, I will give to that which I believe in. So if you do believe in the ministries of the church, in his vision, friends, we're a part of something which is more exciting even than Solomon's building, Solomon's temple. When we give generously, we're helping to construct God's temple made up of people who are being redeemed by the gospel of grace. I believe that someday... When I walk the streets of glory, I'm going to bump into people who are going to be there because, guess what? I gave my money. And indirectly. In fact, one of the parables of Jesus talks about that in Luke 16. To be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Um, I, I, I I love the movies Schindler's List. You remember that gut-wrenching scene at the end of the movie where Schindler is he's going to his car and he looks around and he sees all the Jews that he had saved and he, and he says to his friend, I, I could have done more. I, I, I could have saved more. And let's give. Last thing I want to say is this, and I was thinking about this. What a time to talk about generosity with the economic situation that we're in at this present time. Bit of a challenge, isn't it? 
bit of a challenge to be generous in times like this. Maybe some of us are even wondering how you're going to pay your few bills. Well, now is the time to believe God, to trust in God. I can, even, even a dummy like me notices when I go and get my food. I said, how much? <laughs> Oh, you go into a fish and chip shop, you treat your family, how much? <laughs> 38 pounds, how much for a few fish and chips? And even I'm noticing that, and I generally would never notice anything like that. And so here I am at a time like this talking to God's people about being generous. Well, maybe that's the challenge of it all. Maybe that's the challenge that's coming to each and every one of us uh, to give uh, generously to the Lord. It might be a long time before you hear a message like this, but let, let God's word sink in. Let God's word do what it's meant to do in your heart. Uh, Rich is going to come up in a moment, but I'll, 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 I'll leave you with the challenge then. Who then? Who then is willing to consecrate himself to the work of God? This day, who, who then is willing to consecrate himself to the Lord? Thank you for listening to which is not always the most challenging subject, but I trust that you'll be challenged uh, in your giving, and I will as well. Thank you.